Hola, and welcome back to Unpredictable. I am your host, John Asino, and this is episode number 16, I believe. Um, so today, I want to go over a little bit about, you know, how I, how I approach the gym since surgery. Um, I know a lot of people have been asking me, you know, how have I adapted to, you know, new forms of working out. Um, you know, before before my surgery, I was pretty active in the gym. Um, I didn't have any trouble, you know, performing any specific exercises. So after surgery, it was pretty difficult for me to, you know, understand the proper path to go down to figure out, you know, which ways I should work out. You know, for a while I struggled with, you know, I want to build muscle. You know, every, you know, again, everyone wants to to look their absolute best, you know, the summer bot, all that bullshit. But I was kind of, you know, reluctant to understand that I need to focus a lot on my, you know, my range of motion. So, for example, so you see how quickly I move, you know, again, I'm sorry. Um, if you're listening to this, you're not going to be able to watch what I'm doing. So I'm moving my hands right now. Um, so you see how quick I move this hand right here, but look how quick I can move this hand. So that's an automatic, you know, sign that, you know, I lost a lot of coordination in my left side of my body. So another thing is, is range of motion. So when I go straight up with this arm versus going straight up with this arm, it takes a lot more, you know, focus. You know, when I come down, it kind of just wants to come down. There's no slow you know, it's, it's much more difficult for me to control it. You know, another, another example I can use is boxing. Okay. You can, I can throw a punch, but I can only throw it so fast because my arm has no control. Really. It doesn't want to come straight back. It wants to, it wants to flow it around. So if you want to throw the hands, then, you know, you're probably going to walk away with a W. So, but anywho, so I want to go, I want to go into what I, what I've done to really, you know, pay attention to progression, but also maintaining and gaining muscle. How do I incorporate, you know, some of my exercises I've learned throughout my, my therapy sessions with what I've learned in the gym and how to, you know, how to build the muscle. So I actually have these books here. Um, when I first, you know, when I first started my little journey after surgery, I like I like to you know document what I what I worked out. So I have um, this book doesn't have any numbers. So I mentioned in a previous episode I numbered um, my exercises, what I did daily. Um, pretty so okay. Here we go. This is day one. This is this is crazy. This is September twentieth of two thousand eighteen. So I, again I. My surgery was June 4th, so this is what, June, July, it's about three months, three months, I don't know, whatever. So what I had to work out then was I did the elliptical for 30 minutes, then I would do dips. So I remember, you know, performing the dips, so if anybody's familiar with a dip, you know, I really hope everyone knows what a dip is. but. I would favor this side of my body. So when I would go down, I would lean to my right side a little bit, which was very awkward. And that was, that took a long time for me to, you know, to get over the little hump. But after dips, I did, you know, I had one dumbbell, I think it was 30 pounds or so, where I would do the shoulder exercises, like I, I recently mentioned, to, con you know, to get the control. And I remember from this is when I would go up, my arm like it did not want to go straight down. It wanted to go like like this way, which was very, very weird. That also took a very long time. That's something I'm actually still working on today. But it's something I've consistently paid attention to and I know that, you know, I need to keep working at it for for me to perfect it. I understand that. After dumbbell shoulders, I did box steps. So on my floor, I have uh, I have uh, tile floors that you know form the box. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that. I hope so. But I would literally like hopscotch when you have to 
you know, two, one, you have to jump in the box. I would just take a step into one box, take a step into the box to the right, left, you know what I mean? Like create a, create a square. And I would, I would literally just do that. And an exercise like that was so difficult for me at the time, because again, I could not walk. I was in a wheelchair. So simple exercise like that helped my balance and it helped me, you know, continue to progress, which was extremely important for me at the time. After box steps, I would do BOSU balance, okay? So if you're not familiar with the BOSU ball, it's that half ball that's blue. You know, you're pretty sure like every gym has it. I, I know. It's, a very, it's a very popular piece of equipment. So I would, I couldn't balance on this ball for more than two seconds, but it would be two seconds one day, maybe three seconds the next day, and it would keep building up to where I'm at today, where I, where I can stand on the ball. You know, I, it's still difficult, but you know, it's I can stand on a lot longer than it used to be. So after BOSU balance, I would do 100 push-ups. Now the 100 push-ups I did, I did every single day and for a very long time. That was the one, you know, the one thing that that contributed most to my the muscle building part, you know, I guess that and the dips was big. That was that gave me a sense of normalcy. You know, a lot of the workouts I had to perform were um, reminded me that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do a lot of things. So when I was able to do, you know, a simple thing like a push up or a dip, it kind of reminded me that you know it's difficult now, but I can continue continue working at it and eventually I will get where, you know, where I need to be. Um, okay, here, this is a good one actually. So this is my hundredth day after surgery. This is on January 1st. This is March 7th of 2000, I guess 2018, where I, would, I was still doing the elliptical for 30 minutes. Um, this specific day I was doing curls, probably with the, probably with a lighter. So now when I had, when I was doing curls, so, because I lost the coordination of my hand, I would be able to bring the curl up. But I, when I went down, I wasn't able to control it going down. So again, it would flow. My arm would flow. So it took a lot of, you know, paying attention. It took a lot of, you know, self-awareness to understand where I needed to focus on the negative. So that was, you know, that was huge. That took a very long time for me to do that. You know, I still deal with, um, I still deal with difficulties with that you know, today, which is very important to realize. Um, the curls, then I, I bounced into the dips. I mentioned the dips. Chin-ups, you know, if you're not familiar with a chin-up, you know, you know you do a pull-up where you hold this way, a chin-up, you're just reversing, okay? Um, same thing with a chin-up, I would favor my right side, my dominant side, because my left side was weak, and I, you know, I needed to work. But chin-ups was, Gyms was very good. That's something I still incorporate in my workouts today. Amazing calisthenic workout that I highly, highly recommend. Then I have a fly here. So probably a chest fly where I I don't remember I don't remember how much weight I did, but same thing. So when I would use my left hand, I would go down, it would flow. So I wouldn't be able to go straight back to the same position. You know, it would maybe I would get up here. And actually, this actually reminds me, when I would come up, my arm couldn't just stop mid, you know, body line. It would go forward. It wouldn't, I wouldn't have the control to just stop it. So when I would go down, it would flow. You know, it would flow to that point. And then I would come up, and it would be difficult for me to just stop it. That was, that was a big thing. That's something I still, I still have trouble with today. That's, I don't even think I do, like, dumbbell flies today, because I know how difficult it is for me to to control it. So I, I kind of stay away from something like that. It's not really that important for me to to do it. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's I got there's other ways to work your your inner chest, your chest muscles than a fly. Um, pull ups, I mentioned chin up this way, pull up this way, and push ups. So again I told you I do the push ups. I did them religiously. You know, I knew that that was going to help me build muscle. And this was actually a circuit workout. So I would do the elliptical, 
no, no, no. I would start with the elliptical. I would do the curls, dips, chin-ups, fly, pull-ups, push-ups, and a circuit. So it would just be one set. And I would probably do three sets of that. So that was the hundredth day. Okay. Um, let's see what else I got going on here. Let's see what I got on here. Um, stand by. Okay. Well, this is not going to work. Oh, this is 62. It's not 100. We don't want to re We don't want to go back. Let's go to the end of this book. Um, this is. I think this is my last book. I kind of stopped documenting because it was, although it was encouraging me to continue working, it was still, it was still reminding me of like how, like how much further I needed to go. It was discouraging me pretty badly, so I um, I I stopped. Um. Yeah, I don't know if this book is gonna. Yeah, this book isn't gonna, you know, tell us what I continue. But I would say closer to two hundred days is when I first started getting into the gym, and that was really when I started to, you know, perfect the range of motion, and that's where I became a big fan of the Smith machine. So, for all of my people who aren't familiar with the Smith machine, it's the assisted machine. You know, I know a lot of the females, a lot of girls like to do it because you can do lighter weight, but you can control it, and you can you can really target the muscle you're working on. So when I first got out of the gym, and I would try to do regular chest, uh, the bench, regular squat, but it was difficult for me to control it. So for the chest, I would, let's just say I was doing regular bench, I would go up. Again, this arm would want to float, so it would make the bar kind of cockeyed, and it would throw me off my balance, and it just was no bueno. No, I didn't fuck with that shit at all, so I kind of tossed that to the side. I figured out, I adapted to, you know, what I needed to work on. I bounced the Smith machine, and, you know, since my recovery has started, the Smith machine has done absolute wonders, and I'll probably continue to use the Smith machine. Because I'm not really into the, the bodybuilding movements. Um, I don't need to be a power lifter. I just like, you know, I, I like to perfect form. I like to perfect, you know, work capacity, volume. So, again, Smith Machine is huge. Back to the squat. So, I mentioned in a previous episode, I believe it was with Danny, that when I squatted, when I was in a regular squat rack, and I would, I would unrack the weight, and taking that, you would have to step back when you unracked it. That step would was incredibly difficult for me. It wasn't like it wasn't very simple as you would think. Um, that taking my left foot and being able to place it where it needed to be was close to impossible. It was extremely difficult. So again, I looked for different ways to work on my squat. So I went to the Smith machine. And that has, you know, really helped my recovery in, in terms of form and in terms of range of motion. It was, it was perfect. And that's something I still, I still do in the gym today. So let me, uh, let me just give an example of how I would go in the gym today, what I do in the gym. So again, as a person who struggles pretty badly as with balance, um, coordination is still very weak. Um, vision, but we'll touch on vision in a little bit. Um, I use specific machines that you know don't really encourage me to use too much, you know, coordination, too much balance, but encourage range of motion. So that's why I I use the Smith machine so much. So when I go in and I do chest, you know, I have to bench. I use the Smith machine so I can focus on going all the way up, but I don't have to focus on this part right here. It just goes straight back down to where I need it to be, which is which is incredibly important for me. And um, if I go in and I'm doing if I'm doing legs, squatting, squatting on the Smith machine at all times. Now this doesn't mean I can't squat on a regular rack. I can. I I I. I haven't perfected it, but I've I've tried. I try and switch it up every other week to know that my body understands the proper movement. I think it's very important for you to build some type of muscle memory 
in the gym and especially in my in my case it was important for my body to understand which way to lean which which body part to favor when I'm performing a specific exercise so that's really how I incorporate different workouts in the gym and a perfect example is why I'm so passionate about this is um, when I was first uh, when I was first getting back in the gym and this was this was a, a pretty big time for me because I had been out of the gym for for quite a while several months and when you're in a like a retro fitness or an LA fitness all those commercial gyms you don't really see anybody with disabilities I think it's an insurance thing I'm not really sure I don't want to point any fingers but you never see anybody with disabilities so I walk in the gym one day and there was this this is there was this little kid and his father and the little kid had cerebral palsy so I'm not a scientist I really don't know what the technical term for cerebral palsy is but it's pretty it's it looks pretty difficult I mean it for someone to deal with something like that on a daily basis it, it must be extremely hard but seeing someone in the gym who was struggling as much as I did but you can physically see it now that was a big thing for me is when you see me in the gym you just see somebody who has muscles and and works out and you don't necessarily see someone struggling so when I saw this person physically struggling it it you know at the time it really made me emotional because I was that I was that person for a very long time who who I knew I was struggling the most in the gym not just the gym but in life I was struggling the most so seeing somebody who was obviously dealing with a lot for them to you know step out of their comfort zones and to walk in a gym where they probably knew that they would be, you know, they would be talked about, stared at, was it was extremely eye opening for me. I ended up going up to the little Kenneth's father, and I I thanked them. I said, I this is awesome that you are in here showing that you know there's much more to this than people think. And although you know there had to be a hundred people in the gym, every single person was staring at this kid, like what are you doing in here? It was just extremely eye-opening for me and that's a big part of why I, I work so hard today is because I know where I was physically and I know how I used to perform in the gym and that's what consistently reminds me that I have to continue working as hard as I do for me to stay this path and to work as hard as I do you know I need to continue using these different these different exercises in the gym because they focus not only on building muscle or what, whatever, but it's focusing on my range of motion. It's helping me recover, you know, and it's been, I mean, you know, next month, the beginning of June will be my third year since my surgery. Okay. And I know, I know it's extremely discouraging for me because I know where I came from and I know where I am now so you know although it is discouraging for me to realize that you know I'm still you know very far off from my my end goal but it's also encouraging because I can look back and and see where I was see where I've come from and be grateful that I am you know I am still progressing I'm still getting better and I always will continue to get better because that has become my mentality. I'm going to be the very best at what I do at all times. It's, it's how it is, you know, it's how my brain is, it's fucking like, that's what I need to fucking do. I need to show everybody who's down me that I got this shit, you know, I'm going to figure it out. No matter how difficult a road may get for anybody, there's always a way. There's always a way to keep on pushing the boundaries. So I mentioned what I do in the gym. I mentioned how I adapt to my certain surroundings. I adapt, you know, how I work on, you know, building muscle, but I also work on my balance. 
Another thing I think I need to address here is my my vision. Okay, so it's a the vision issues that I deal with today are are the worst. You know, it's but it's also the worst because nobody can see it, and that's very difficult for me. A lot of people think because I wear these glasses that. I just have glasses on, but you don't realize that I also have contacts on also for my actual vision. You know, I can see 2020 with my contacts on, but when I had my surgery, um, because it was located in the back of my brain, closer to my optic nerves, um, I'm going to have a, a little bit more of an expert type person to speak about this in a later episode but it had to deal with my coordination. So the coordination behind my eyes was was not damaged, but it was kind of, you know, misplaced. They were weakened. So I, ha I have severe double vision in my left eye. So immediately after my surgery, I, I mean, I really couldn't see out of my left eye. It was, it was basically, like I had to wear an eye patch for most of my time. Several months after surgery, I was wearing the eye patch, but it was something, excuse me, it was something extremely difficult for me to comprehend, the fact that I would never see. So back to the glasses, so I wear my contacts. Um, what's going on with my contacts right now? Won't you? But, so my contacts encourage, or encourage, whatever, prescription, okay? I see, tw I see 2020 but I still have the double vision. So if I cover one eye, I can see phenomenally. If I cover the other eye, fantastic, wonderful. But when both of them are working together, it's no bueno. <laughs> it just, it's really just not good. Um, so that's why I have these glasses. These are called prism glasses. Um, I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with prisms, but basically it fuses my eyes together to work in one. So as I'm looking, let's just say I'm looking at the camera right now, without the glasses on, there's the camera, obviously, but there's also a second little camera, okay, double vision, okay? The little microphone on top of the camera, okay? I have two of those, double vision. But if I put the glasses on, holy shit, one fucking camera, okay? So that's something I want to address with a lot of people is that I have very, very bad vision problems right now. And back to surgery, okay. I had to wear the eye patch for quite a while. What's going on here? What's... Yeah? So I had to wear the eye patch for quite a while. All right, several months or so. I was with the eye patch, and also in a wheelchair. Catastrophe, I know. But once the eye patch came off, I was still dealing with significant double vision. It was it was pretty bad. Okay, for for example, I could not drive. Um, and for everybody who knows me, driving is like a very like a very strong skill I have. Okay, I'm a very good driver. Um, from racing motocross to whatever, I've become very good at operating machines. I don't know what it is, I'm very good at it. So can you can only imagine what this did to me is that I could not drive. I couldn't drive a car, I couldn't operate, you know, my, my, my quad. You know, I couldn't go riding with my friends. Um, I couldn't operate a boat, you know, you know, my parents had a boat that I would drive all the time, couldn't do that. Um, I couldn't, like we would go rent the, um, what the fuck are those boats called? A catamaran or whatever, the flat bo boats, whatever, you go to like FGO or something like that, couldn't drive that. Um, I had a jet ski at the time, couldn't drive a jet ski because, and again, the vision, it was really stopping me from fully, you know, you know, fully being independent, you know, having, having the most fun, 
Okay, you don't realize how good your vision is until it's taken away. It's pretty crazy. But um, so right now, um, basically, if I were to like, I would closely relate it to a camera. So when you when you shake your camera, so you take your phone out, you know, you take your camera and you go like this, your camera can't focus. There's no, it's out of whack. That's basically my eye. So when I shake my head like this, I don't, I'm dizzy as a fuck. Okay, it's very difficult for me to basically stand up and walk because I feel like I'm gonna fall over. But that's what I mean about vision, okay? Basically picture being drunk all times, at all times throughout the day. That's basically me, okay? I, I don't drink, um, it's, it really just doesn't cooperate with my whole vestibular system vestibular system has to do with your equilibrium and it controls your vision and all that good stuff. So basically, you know, I can't, I, you know, I don't mess around with anything that encourages my vision to be worse than it already is. Extremely discouraging. So back to the driving. I just started driving relatively recently. Um, again, we're almost at my third year, you know, post surgery. I'm, I started driving like, this past year, several months ago. So you can only imagine how bad the vision is, was. Um, it still is pretty bad, okay? These glasses, if I don't have these glasses on, I will not drive, okay? So it makes it, you know, I, I cannot wear sunglasses. Um, I can't, you know, I can't just like walk out of the gym or wherever. I started driving. Okay, I have to make sure these glasses are on me at all times. You know, even when I'm doing something as as you know as easy as reading or like how I'm looking at my laptop right now, you know, it's much easier for me to have the glasses on when I'm when I'm looking at my laptop because I can see. You know, I can read everything pretty easily versus not having them on. When I'm, when I'm watching TV, if I'm laying on a specific side, you know, it's easier for me to lay on this shoulder right here because I'm seeing more out of this eye. So I can see, I don't have double vision when I look in that corner. But if I'm on this shoulder and I look this way, it's like almost impossible for me to, you know, watch anything. So I just wanted to quickly, you know, talk about this. You know, I wanted to mention because I know a lot of people wonder why I have, why I wear these glasses, but why I also have contacts on. That's extremely important for a lot of people to understand, is that I have contacts on, but I wear glasses, okay? Let's, let's remember that, you know, cement that into the brain, okay? I'm not wearing these for fun, okay? I need to wear these for me for, to see straight, okay? If you see me without these on, and you, and you start fucking waving at me, and I don't wave back, there's a good chance I can't even see you. All right, so let's just, if you listen, if you listen to this, if you watch this, just remember, okay, these glasses aren't on. I would suggest you don't wave at me because you're gonna feel real shitty when I don't wave back, all right? So again, I just wanna quickly go over this with all of you. I want to mention, you know, slightly elaborate on a lot of the issues that I'm dealing with. But again, I'm going to have somewhat of an expert sit down on this podcast with me and really dive into the vision issues, you know, that I'm dealing with. But again, just a quick little summary of what the fuck I'm dealing with. All right. So listen, everybody, if you guys enjoy, you know, my conversations, if you're inspired, motivated, please, you know, share this with your family, your friends, tell them to tell their family their friends, who knows, maybe someone would be a little bit more interested, you know, maybe they have some of a, like a family member, a friend that's dealing with some type of adversity that they need to hear something like this, okay, I would really love to sit down and speak with somebody who also is facing some, you know, some sort of, you know, turmoil, some, some sort of, you know, obstacle in front of them that is extremely hard for them to overcome, so everybody, Let's remember, it is always, always a good day to have a good day. I'm going to catch up on the next one.